Welcome students. We are now going to learn a little bit about genetics so that this understanding of genetics can help us better understand also evolution. So we just barely learned that natural selection causes evolution and adaptation, right? Whenever there is variation present, then you have a selective pressure like this bird eating, you know, the beetles and on average it's going to eat more green beetles than, than the brown beetles because of their color. And so you get a change in a characteristic over time. More and more brown beetles uh, begin to appear. But the question is, what actually causes that color in the beetles? And how does the distribution of colors in the population change over time? So that's what we need. We need to have a little bit of information about genetics in order to understand those questions better. And to do this, we're going to be using uh, fruit flies quite a bit. We're going to talk about fruit flies. So just a quick intro to fruit flies. Uh, this is from the genus Drosophila. And they uh, are insects, of course. They lay eggs. The eggs hatch and become larvae, and the larvae get a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger each molt until they become a pupa, and then they hatch. Uh, they go through their pupal stage, which is where the metamorphosis takes place, and then they become the adults. And if you look at Drosophila from the exact same species, this is Drosophila melanogaster, there is a wide variety of different forms here. You can see some of them are darker, some of them are lighter, bigger, and so forth. So there's actually quite a bit of variation even in, in the same species. And if we zoom in on a couple of the characteristics, maybe you can even see what some either uh, some of these um, large differences are. For example, here we have different eye colors. Some fruit flies have red eyes, some have this darker eyes, some have white eyes, right? Here is an example of two fruit flies, and as you can see, the fruit fly on the top here lacks wings, or it has these little, little tiny wings. And over here, we have a fruit fly that has a much darker um, abdomen on the end than this fruit fly. So clearly, there are some differences here. Well, trying to figure out what is it that's in the genes that's causing, or you know, how. How is it that all of these differences can appear? And then how can they be passed on from one gener generation to the next? This was a huge question for um, many people uh, after and around the time of Darwin and, and then even into the 20th century. And so many people have been working on this from Mendel to Thomas Morgan and many others looking at how does genetics work. And so we're going to kind of run through some simple examples to to figure out the logic and to kind of try to construct the logic of genetics in our own minds. So look at this example. Here we have a true breeding um, fly that has wings. And the reason we know it's true breeding is because for many, many generations, the only flies that have ever come out of this you know, familial line are fruit flies with wings. Yet over here we have fruit fly that has these vestigial wings, right? They're kind of all folded up and cr crinkled. And and we know that this is a true breeding, you know, vestigial winged fly because for many, many, many generations, the only flies that ever uh, emerge out of, out of the pupa are these flies with these vestigial wings. Okay, so we have these two populations of true breeding fruit flies. But now we take one from each of those populations, we bring them together, and we will allow them to mate. And we watch what happens in the offspring. Now, before we talk about that, I want, I'm going to be using these two words, and so I want to define them very well. Phenotype is what we see. So in this case, we're talking about wings. So here I see normal wings, and over here I see vestigial wings. That's the phenotype. The genotype is the underlying genetics that's causing either normal wings or uh, these vestigial wings. And I'll talk about the way that we, uh, that in genetics, we usually have a notation for these that involves these letters. For right now, just realize that there is the genotype, which is the underlying genetic information that then causes the phenotype, which is what we actually see, which what is exp what is expressed. So if we look at the parental generation, that's why we have the P here, they reproduce and produce an F1 generation. The F there is uh, comes from filio, which is uh, Latin for child, right? So we have the F1 generation. And in the F1 generation, after we do this cross, all of the flies have wings. Not one fly had vestigial wings. Now that ought to make you start to scratch your head. Well, wait a second. What happened to the vestigial wings, right? Well, the investigators that studied these types of problems, Mendel and Morgan and others, they did not stop at the F1 generation. They continued to go, and then they allowed the F1 generation to cross with itself. And they saw what happened in the F2 generation. And in the F2 generation, they started to see also some very interesting things, like 
about three quarters of the flies had wings and about one quarter of the flies did not have wings. And so you start to see this interesting pattern of characteristics can essentially skip a generation. They always appear in these really specific numbers, three to four, three to one ratios, and, 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 the, and that it seems like the, the winged characteristic or the winged phenotype somehow can cover up or be dominant to the vestigial phenotype. And so they thought a lot about these things and they came up with some major conclusions. And, and hopefully you can kind of already start to think of some of these conclusions as well, but we're going to lay them out and go through them one at a time. So the four conclusions from these crosses, which are called monohybrid crosses, that F1 generation, um, we call that a monohybrid. And we'll, that'll make more sense as we go forward. But there, the first conclusion was that there are alternative forms of genes. Okay, now we call these alleles. Back then they didn't really have that name, they just talked about these alternative forms. But recall that inside the nucleus there are chromosomes, and chromosomes are these big pieces of linear DNA that are all super coiled and wound up. But if you could stretch these out into a particular region, you could find a region that had a gene on it. Right? So it's like starting here at this sequence of DNA uh, nucleotide, and it goes through a bunch of DNA nucleotides down to another end, and that's the end of the gene. So for example, for wings, we're looking at the genes that produces, that has something to do with the production of wings, where if you have a normal genetic sequence, then you get wings expressed normally. But if you have a genetic sequence that has some differences in it, then you have vestigial wings. So these are two different alleles because they're two different forms of phenotypic expression of that gene. So the gene is for wings, the alleles are for either normal or vestigial. This might make more sense if we talk about some other examples. Here's an example from humans. There is a gene that affects the way that the earlobe is constructed. And some people have a an allele, a form of this gene that is free, that causes the earlobe to be free and dangling, and other people have a form of this gene for earlobe construction that causes it to be attached. So we have the gene for earlobe construction and it has two different forms, unattached and attached. I also want to point out that not all genes have only two alleles or two forms. Some genes have multiple alleles or multiple forms, more than two. An example of this might be blood type. You know that, there, that the phenotype for blood type is A, B, A, B, or O, but this comes from a combination of multiple alleles where you can have an allele that's an A allele, a B allele, or this other allele that is called the, the sub-I allele, but these have to do with these structures that are found on the outside of the red blood cells. But the point is that genes can have more than just two alleles. But we're going to simplify things as we talk and we'll be using systems that are just two allele systems for genes.